Okay, I think we'll we'll go ahead and start. Welcome everyone. My name is Jamie Schenker Passero. I am the Associate Director of the Temple Small Business Development Center. And today we are launching our first series of potentially we're not sure how many, but we have at least the next four planned out uh, where we're bringing in experts to talk to you about topics relevant to surviving as a small business right now during COVID-19. So we're thinking carefully about um, just the different type of questions that you may be having right now and just taking the time to, to think about, about your business holistically. Today we're going to be focusing on protecting your finances specifically. Uh, we know that Ooh, this is just going however it wants to. Um, we know that not everyone who applied for EIDL or PPP got those funds. So you may be thinking about alternative ways to protect your finances right now. So that was, uh, that's the basis of this presentation today. We are one of 16 FBDCs in Pennsylvania. We cover Philadelphia, Lower Bucks, and Lower Montgomery County. So if you are in any of those areas, you are able to connect with us for some of our other services, which include one-on-one -on -one consulting. And we have some specializations in marketing and technology commercialization, which our consultant Carl is in charge of. We also have a procurement specialist. Um, our mission is to help small businesses start and grow, and we do that through our consulting services and through programs like this. And I'm going to, uh, we also have an incubator that is currently not functioning, but we hope to get that up and running whenever campus opens. Um, we also have a legal clinic, and we, uh, we have consultants who help connect businesses to lenders. So if that is the direction that you're thinking of going, maybe you just want to get a straight loan. That's something that we can help you with on our end as well. And I wanted to point out uh, our upcoming calendar of virtual trainings. If you are more in the early pre-venture stage and you're joining us today, you might want to consider our eight-week virtual business plan class, and we'll be starting that on the 5th. Um, We'll also be running tomorrow a session on micro-importing. Maybe you're thinking about altering your business model somewhat and that's coming into play. So you can check out that session. Um, there'll be a lot of individual assistance with the session. It'll be, or it'll be intimate, it'll be like a conversation. Uh, we are also going to be running beginner meditation for entrepreneurs on Mondays. So meditation Mondays in May. And that's in response to knowing how much stress that entrepreneurs have on their shoulders right now. So it's just, it's quick, it's 30 minutes, but hopefully it'll help you clear your head so that you can make better decisions and just channel all of that stress and all of those thoughts um, in, in, a, in a healthy way. And then for our next small business survival session that we're doing, it will be on web tools for remote work. We know a lot of businesses abruptly had to move to remote work. So we want to introduce some virtual, uh, some virtual assistance for you. So it could be using Slack, it could be using um, Google products. Uh, what else are we doing? Zoom, of course, um, tips on hosting and not just as a participant, because there are a lot of tips and tricks that I've been learning myself. And then the following week, we'll be talking about growth through collaboration. Uh, we're doing another session that's not a Wednesday session, but uh, on marketing and the value of a customer. Um, and then we'll be, doing, uh, we'll be doing a small business survival class on lease addendums. And I think Carl will touch on that as a potential strategy in protecting your finances today. Um, okay, get to the next slide. Uh, so we have everyone muted, but we welcome questions that you can type in the chat or in the Q&A, and I'll make sure that Carl gets to them. And at the end, we will um, we'll give out some contact information, and I will also post in the chat box 
our resource page. We've been maintaining that for the past few weeks with helpful links and resources, links to our upcoming webinars, as well as links to the recordings of previous webinars. So I'll put that link in. It also includes a link to our virtual Zoom office hours. So that is something that our consultants have been doing every weekday from three to five. If you have just a few quick questions that you want answered, you could talk to a person face-to-face -face virtually um, but but that's 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 some way you can get your questions answered if you don't want to you're not ready to sit down for a full one on one consulting session. So all of that um, is easily linked on that resource page that I will put in the chat. And so then I will now introduce Carl, who you see on your screen. He is a senior business consultant and he specializes, like I mentioned, in new technology. Uh, he has so many years of experience and always knows the answers to my questions. So Carl, you have the floor, take it away. And I will stop my screen share so you can show yours. There we go. Okay, well, good uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad you could join us today. And as Jamie said, what we're going to be doing is talking about techniques and approaches to conserve cash and to manage your finances within your business during times of stress and uncertainty. So for our uh, session today, we're going to focus on first just a, a short discussion of the importance of cash in a business. Why is cash important? Um, then we're going to look at you know, the concept of managing cash flow. This may be new to some of you, but um, looking at what cash flow is and the importance of managing that. And basically, in summary, it's cash coming into the business versus cash going out of the business. So then we're going to look at ways to increase cash flows coming in and also ways to decrease the amount of cash flow going out. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about uh, meeting challenges and uncertainty, and then we'll go into a Q&A session. Um, in the meantime, Jamie, if there's uh, relevant questions that are coming up, and you know, feel free to jump in sure. and those as we go along. So, so what's the situation we're sitting in now? Uh, basically, there are a variety of different situations depending on your business. And we are seeing all of these within the client base of the SBDC at Temple. There's some business obviously that are closed um, by order of the governor or because of lack of customers um, or inability to operate because you can't get the uh, your workers to come in, your staff to come in. Some of the businesses are open, but they're operating at lower levels than they had, or they aren't able to operate the way they used to do, such as restaurants where they can't have people in the dining areas. And so they've pivoted to other operations. Typically those other operations are um, ones that are not generating as much sales as they would generate in, in normal times. And oftentimes, like I said, they've uh, changed to offering different service models or having different products that they're offering, things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, some, surprisingly or thankfully, are totally unaffected by COVID-19. Um, there are many manufacturing firms, from what I've heard, in the area that are operating just as they always have. Uh, there are some that have had to change their operations, but are still able to operate at 75 to 100 percent of their um, capacity. And uh, they're, they're unaffected more or less by um, most of the issues surrounding the current uh, pandemic. And then Fortunately for them, there are several companies that we've worked with that are actually benefiting from the situation at the moment, where they, they might be involved in the production of PPE, uh, personal protection equipment, and things like that, or they may be providing resources um, that are uh, needed right now more than usual. 
And along these lines, I'm thinking cleaning supplies, um, you know, industrial supplies, things like that. And again, we'll talk a little bit about some examples there. Regardless of how the business itself is being affected, what we're seeing is almost all of these businesses are having an effect on the cash they have available and with maintaining sufficient cash within the business. And some of this may just be timing issues, some of it is a matter of there is not enough cash flowing in or too much cash flowing out. These kind of problems aren't limited to the current pandemic. They're things that will happen at any time uh, to an individual business or to groups of business, depending on what the local situation is and um, what, what events are occurring, whether they're blizzards, hurricanes, earthquakes, etc., or in the case that we're dealing with now, a pandemic. And these kind of situations can stress a business's financial resources. And so it's important for you to understand in the immediate sense what to do now, but also to think ahead to what you're going to do to help build uh, resiliency and protect your business in the future when one of these types of events occurs again. So, so why is cash so important? Well, obviously, in order to pay your bills, you need cash. And when we talk about cash, we're talking about all forms of easily accessible money. So this includes bank accounts. It includes um, easy, you know, inventory of finished goods that can be sold. Um, and it also includes, obviously, just cash on hand um, and available. Oftentimes, we also look at credit card balances, um, you know, available credit on credit cards as being cash, if it's something that's going to be paid off uh, during the next billing cycle. So, so what do we do? Yeah, why do we need this? Well, obviously, the first thing is operating expenses, and that's one of the things that companies right now are really uh, struggling with. These are the fixed costs that are not going to disappear just because your sales disappeared. So these are things like rent, utility payments, insurance payments, uh, issues like that. Payroll is another expense that requires cash, either on a weekly basis, a bi-weekly basis, or a monthly basis. And um, these payments need to be made in order to transfer money to the employees. Obviously, this is something that uh, many companies have adjusted by furloughing or laying off their employees during this time so that they don't have to incur those payroll costs. But it's still an important requirement um, for cash to be available to do that, to pay those expenses. And then we get into a couple other things that are less critical but important all the same. Um, by having available cash reserves, you're able to take advantage of cost savings opportunities. These may be sales that are going on um, from suppliers of key critical items to your business. Uh, discount, just the ability to get discounts on volume purchases. Um, and the ability to go and purchase equipment and technology that could allow you to be more efficient in your operations and to be able to improve customer service and uh, provide better product, uh, better quality products. Taxes obviously have to be paid. Right now, we do have a, in many cases, there is a moratorium on taxes or a holiday on taxes until uh, July, I think, most of them. Um, and then in the shorter term, I think there, there's some delays in the requirements for when sales tax um, submissions need to be paid and things like that to the state. But um, you know, again, you don't want to be in a situation where you don't have the cash to be able to pay your taxes when due, uh, because you certainly don't want to be late with those and you don't want to get seriously behind um, because the costs with that and you know, the penalties for that can kind of accumulate quickly. 
again, with ample cash on hand, you have opportunities uh, to save on transaction costs. Um, this may be the type of thing where you get a reduced price or reduced uh, transaction cost, you know, fees by being able to operate in a COD mode when you purchase things. Um, might, again, might allow you to do things like make larger purchases so that you can get buy-in discounts and also save on the absolute transaction costs, uh, shipping costs, things like that by being able to um, move more, more product at a single time rather than making multiple smaller shipments. And then finally, um, emergencies. And this isn't uh, what I'm talking, uh, what I'm talking about here is not the type of emergencies that we're dealing with with the pandemic, but emergencies like a key piece of equipment breaks and needs to be repaired or replaced at, at a moment's notice. Um, you know, one of your key employees is unable to come to work for any reason and you need to find a replacement and maybe go out and hire a temporary uh, service to be able to cover the uh, the work that that employee would be doing until they could come back. Things like that, just simple loss of electricity can cause um, losses at your business, uh, especially if you're in the restaurant food service business, you could lose a lot of perishable items with through loss of electricity and you need to replace those in order to open. You need to have cash available to quickly go and buy the replacements for that. So cash flow, measuring cash flow. As I said in the introduction, cash flow is a fairly simple co concept. It's the amount of cash coming into a business minus the amount of cash going out. Um, so if the cash coming in is greater than the cash going out, that's referred to as a positive cash flow. If the reverse is, is um, true and you're actually spending more cash than it is coming into the business, it's a negative cash flow. The goal obviously is to maximize positive cash flow so that you're accumulating more cash into the business and you aren't bleeding cash out of the business. But the important thing is when you're looking at that goal to include not starving the business of, of, of resources. And by that, I mean, you can maximize positive cash flow by doing things like delaying maintenance on your equipment, um, putting off employee training, uh, important things like that that are critical to maintaining your business. So you want to make sure that as you, as you are looking at ways to improve the cash in your business that you aren't starving it for both current and future success. So our goal by, to ma maximize the cash flow is obviously to maximize the cash inputs and or minimize the cash outputs. One of the key things here is the timing of the receipts of cash and payments. Because again, we're talking about flow. This is a dynamic concept. It's just not the amount of cash sitting in your business. It's the way cash flows in and flows out through your business, basically, that is critical here. So the timing is just as important as the amounts. And in addition to all that, in order to smooth out those time, that timing, it's often important to make sure that you have access to capital so that you have flexibility to take opportunities, to take advantage of the opportunities such as I was suggesting on the previous slide. So having a line of credit available for your business or having credit cards that have a, re, you know, business credit cards that have a reasonable um, balance on them uh, is important so that you have the ability to take short-term, very short-term loans, hopefully, um, on those, facilities, those, those capital facilities, so that you have uh, the ability to weather short-term storms. So for those of you that are new to the concept of cash flow, this is a table that I pulled actually from uh, one of the um, business financing courses that I've taught, uh, workshops that I've taught. And um, this gives an example for a business that 
purchases, basically sells computer systems to um, senior care facilities and uh, um, yeah, plus 55, 55 plus communities. Um, so basically what they do is they have a standard package that is a modem, a router, and a laptop. And they provide those um, along with installation for people so that they can communicate through the internet. But very simple business. What they do is they purchase units. Um, a unit is considered to be that package of equipment. And then they, they have independent contractors that do the installation. And for every installation, the contractor gets paid uh, $200, I believe it was. Um, no, $100, I'm sorry, gets paid $100. And each of the units um, is installed, the contractor installs it, and then the contractor bills the company the supplier of the equipment invoices the company, and then the company makes payments. So in this case, we're looking down here, we have cash available is $9,000 when they start uh, at the beginning of May, coming up on the beginning of May. And they go out and they purchase the 18 units. Now they have agreements with their supplier that they will pay within 30 days on those 18 units. And I'm sorry, they buy those on credit card. And so they charge it onto the credit card and then they go out and the following week they start installing. So they have the independent contractors installing. At the end of that week, the independent contractor submits their invoice for that week. So that would be on the 18th of May, they get an invoice from the contractor. The um, contractor then works the second week and the third week and issues invoices from that the company pays those invoices to the contractor the following week. So that's how you see here, they're getting invoices for the installation of the equipment and they're paying the contractor each week for the six units that they're installing during that week. Meanwhile, up here, the credit card bill comes due for the 18 units. So what happens is that they, or I'm sorry, they receive the credit card bill. So what happens here is they're reducing the cash flow by $600 a week as they pay their contractor. Out here, they finally, 30 days after they receive the credit card bill, they now have to pay the credit card bill. So they pay the $7,200, which is the bill for the 1,800 units. But now that depletes their cash to zero. Finally, the community that they installed all this equipment to pays their invoice, which is 30 days after the invoice was submitted, and now their cash balance is back up to 13.5. So you can see how if they didn't have the 9,000 cash balance, sorry, there we go. If they didn't have the 9,000 cash balance at the beginning of May, they would have run out of money well before the end of June, before they received payment for this. So this is what I'm talking about with respect to timing of payments and the importance of thinking about cash rather than just profitability. Because they made a nice $4,500 on that whole project, but they had to wait for almost two months to be able to see that money and meanwhile had multiple bills to pay. Okay, so what are some of the challenges that you can um, incur in uh, looking at your cash flow. Certainly one of the things that we've seen as a result of the pandemic and the sudden instant closing of businesses within Pennsylvania was a sudden decrease in sales. Sales went from humming along nicely to nothing. Um, and that obviously cuts off the bulk of the cash that flows into a normal business because most of the cash coming into a business is revenue from selling products or services. You can also have problems if you have sudden increase in costs, things like raw material prices going up, operating expenses such as uh, utilities, fuel, things like that increases can 
essentially re increase the costs in your uh, operations and cause the uh, reduction in the total amount of cash in the business. The sudden interruption of operation, and this isn't just sales, you could continue doing sales, uh, especially if you have inventory, but if your operations are stopped for any number of reasons, again, this could be weather, could be um, civil strikes, anything like that can interrupt the operations and that can end up causing uh, you know, continued expenses, but income coming into the business. One that people don't think about is a sudden decrease in your credit rating. If you have a credit rating that is solid, your vendors, the people that are providing you with raw material, maybe they're providing you with staffing, um, would typically extend credit to you such that you get things like 30 day terms. You can purchase your, your raw materials, they'll ship them to you and you don't have to pay for them for 30 days. If your credit rating goes south, you'll lose that ability. And um, most of you have probably heard of Dun & Bradstreet's and the credit ratings that they maintain, they're constantly looking at your pay rate with your vendors things like that. I've had examples with a client who was in the uh, uh, equipment manufacturing and they had a dispute with one of their raw material suppliers, one of their uh, sub, sub assembly require, uh, suppliers, and they stopped payment on all invoices to that, that um, supplier. That supplier turned around and reported those late payments or the lack of payments to Dun & Bradstreet our client lost their credit rating with Dun & Bradstreet and ended up having to go on cash purchase for all their supplies from all their suppliers as a result of that. So you need to be very careful in protecting your credit rating if you can, if you're buying material, especially if you're buying materials or uh, services in on terms. It seems counterintuitive, but a sudden increase in sales can cause negative cash flow. And the reason this occurs, and I'm, I'm working with a client right now that's had, that has this problem. They're an industrial supplier. Uh, they've had a steep increase in demand for industrial cleaning supplies and wipes and protective equipment and all the kind of stuff that they normally supply to people on a regular basis. Um, they've had to go out in order to meet their sales requirements, they've had to go out and find other suppliers because their current supply chain could not supply the volumes that they needed to meet the demand, the sales demand. The problem is when you go out to new suppliers, they normally don't have time, especially if you need, need uh, supplies by the next few days, they don't have time to run credit backgrounds on you and things like that. So they require cash on delivery. So this company is spending cash to purchase large amounts of materials that they will then sell to their current customer base on 30 day terms. And so they're essentially bleeding their cash out of the business to buy the product to sell that eventually they're going to make plenty of profit on. They're going to have a very good year from an income standpoint, from a profitability standpoint and a sales standpoint, but they're going to potentially run out of cash before they get there. Um, and so we're working on essentially the types of things that we're going to be talking about here for improving cash flow. Um, we're working with them on those kind of activities right now. And the other thing that may challenge your cash flow is if there comes a becomes a compelling investment opportunity. Um, this is where you might have a competitor who is reasonably successful, but for some reason is failing and needs someone to come in and partner with them or to come in and buy their business, buy their book of sales, you know, their uh, book of sales, all those kind of things. Um, it's very helpful to have cash available to be able to take an opportunity of that, but that could end up, again, depleting your cash supplies so that you end up with problems in keeping up with your bills and all the other things that we had on that 
Crawley slide. Any questions so far, Jamie? Um, I don't see any. Nope. Yeah, feel, free to answer them, feel free to answer them in the chat if you have them. So how do we increase that cash flows? Remember, basically to improve our cash flow and to improve our cash in the business, cash availability, what we want to do is we want to increase the cash inflows. We want to decrease the cash outflows. So what can we do? First thing, obviously, is to maximize your cash sales. Get as much cash sales as possible as opposed to selling on uh, time. So asking your customers, often you can ask your customers and if they are in reasonable financial shape, they will be willing to pay you on a cash basis. Um, and certainly if you're dealing with, uh, consumers, you can usually get cash, uh, cash payments. And by cash payments, we include credit card and debt debit card payments with this, because from those you will receive the cash in your account within a day or two from when the transaction takes place. You want to. You, you also can, it, you know, especially at this time, we talked about that a little bit, identify alternate products or services or customers to generate additional sales. Um, I'm working with another client right now who had very robust sales uh, to a variety of um, restaurants and they were doing a very good business. And within two days, their business went from very strong to nothing. Uh, meanwhile, they had inventory that was left over sitting in their warehouses of uh, produce and dairy products and things like that, and they had no one to sell it to, and there was no one to take the, uh, take the products. So they decided that they would pivot and um, start putting together boxes of uh, groceries, you know, kind of key groceries, and start selling them to individuals and making uh, deliveries, and they've turned that into a second business that is reasonably, um, you know, keeping, it's keeping most of their staff employed and covering payroll. And, uh, you know, it's got the potential to become a second business operation for them, even when the restaurants uh, reopen and start by purchasing again. Um, we'll I know I've used this service and I'm really glad that they're doing it and appreciated that they pivoted in that way. Yes, we have a satisfied customer on today. Um, and so, and so, yeah, that's one thing that not only is it helping them get through today, but it's also helping them to expand their potential business and broaden their market for the future, which gives them uh, more resiliency as we go through the coming, um, yeah, the future uh, cycles of different um, events that will be happening. And we know they're going to happen. We know events are going to happen. We just don't know when and what, but we know that we'll have uh, adverse events coming up in the future. So it helps to broaden their market so that um, it can uh, cushion some of the, the disruptions that they ex experience. And then as kind of along the same lines as maximizing cash sales, you can accelerate customer payments. One of the things you can do is to offer a small discount for prepayment. Now, this may look like you're losing some profitability, and yes, you are. But if you offer a 1, 2, 3% discount for prepayment, and that allows you to have the cash to go buy additional materials, such as you know, the example I gave of the uh, industrial cleaning supplies company, um, if they can go out and get more material with that cash that they get today, to service the next customer, it is worth one, two, three percent. Um, so, so giving a prepayment discount can often make sense. And that's one of the things that we're, we're looking at for them to do. And the other is that to find your customers who might be late payers, who might be, you know, instead of paying within 30 days or paying within 45 days, and suspend terms for them, basically to get them to pay immediately or within a few days of delivery rather than giving them 30-day terms, which turn into 45-day terms. 
Another thing you can do to generate cash quickly is most companies that have been in operation for 10 years or more have unused or obsolete equipment sitting around or they have and or they have excess inventory, especially if sales are down. And so you can look at other places to sell those materials. Um, certainly there's lots of online places that you can sell used and obsolete equipment. Um, and for the inventory, there's often other customers or other uses uh, for your inventory that might be of interest um, and you can sell. Again, if it's obsolete inventory, you're not gonna sell it to your current customers because it's obsolete. Even if you can convert uh, inventory that on the books is worth maybe you know, $100,000, if you can convert that to $50,000 in cash, you might as well go do it because you need the cash and it's obsolete inventory. So there's uh, very little hope that you're going to get full value for it anyway. If you're in a facility and oftentimes, you know, uh, companies that are in a downturn for one reason or another are in these type of facilities where you might be able to block off a section of it, or if you have excess warehouse space within your facility, you might be able to rent out part of that for storage of almost anything. I mean, you could do you know, household goods you could store for people. You could store uh, inventory for, for someone else, um, depending on the type of space you have. Uh, and if you have excess offices, if you've had some reductions in force and you have excess office space, if you can consolidate that in a single area, you can rent that out to people who are looking for office space, maybe who have left a, you know, left a rental uh, space, a lease space, because they couldn't afford to rent anymore, but they're willing to pay you, you know, several hundred dollars a month for just an office to work out of, that type of thing. And likewise, if you have equipment that you're not using, you can rent that. I have another client that um, has a, uh, a, um, food manufacturing uh, business and they have delivery trucks and their their deliveries are way down because they uh, they are uh, you know, supplying they aren't supplying restaurants the way they were before um, with their packaged foods but uh, they have a couple of uh, refrigerated trucks that are sitting idle so they're in talks with a brewery who needs uh, assistance to be able to deliver um, their, uh, their, their beer and their sales are actually up because um, they're doing more deliveries and less in-house brewing. And so they're in the midst of discussing how that might work and whether the trucks would be leased or whether they would just do the deliveries for them and charge a fee for the delivery, utilizing, keeping their own people employed as well. So um, there's potentials for doing that type of uh, cooperative kind of work as well, looking for other uses for equipment or space that you have available. Carl, I saw a good one locally where it was um, a catering slash food truck. Obviously, they don't have events to, 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 to purvey their goods, so they partnered with a friend who had a space and now they can, you know, someone can come and do pickup orders at that location. So they're, they're sharing costs and, um, you know, that was a good, that was a good pivot. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a good idea as well. So, and then other ways, uh, conventional debt and equity injection or equity injection. So right now, although the banks Many of the banks are consumed with the government uh, loan programs, the Paycheck Protection Program uh, lending. There are banks that are continuing to make commercial loans. Um, and if your business is generally sound and you know, their understanding of the fact that this is a, uh, you know, a temporary situation that we will get out of eventually, um, banks are willing to, if you've got, you know, solid finances, otherwise they're willing to talk to you about loans. And, uh, I'm actually in the middle of closing, not closing yet, but we're almost ready to close on a loan to purchase a, a business. Um, we'd started working on it back in February and, or January, January, and, uh, it's finally ready to go, everything's in place. And so we're looking to hopefully negotiate the terms on that loan and get that closed within the next 30 days or so. 
and the bank is you know perfectly happy to continue doing it because it's a solid business fortunately it's a business that is not closed down it's still operating uh, it's a manufacturing company and deemed to be essential um, so basically it's just a, a transfer of a business from one owner to another and hey, Carl, yes do you mind if I mention um, interface capital just for the spot factoring that's yeah that's my last one there okay I'll wait then yeah so um, and the final thing that's a, becoming more mainstream it used to be uh, something that was uh, you know, kind of knew about 10 years ago or so, it, was, it wasn't it was standard, is financing of your accounts. Uh, it's actually should be accounts receivable, not accounts payable. Um, so if you have accounts receivable sitting out there of any, any quantity, there are companies who will do what's called factoring or financing of those. And the typical approach is that they will essentially contract for the amount that you are owed by customers. They will give you some portion of that up front, maybe 50% of it. And then when the, when the debts are collected, they will give you another 90, 95%, maybe 70 or 80%, depending on the risks associated with collecting those debts, essentially how, how trustworthy and, and uh, financial case, financially capable your customer base is. Um, so the interest is essentially the discount that they give you on the uh, accounts receivable that are collected. Uh, but this is a way to very quickly get at least 50% of your um, accounts, pay, accounts receivable into the company as cash. And as Jamie mentioned, if you want to go ahead and explain what Interface Capital is, yeah, sure. So th they're just a local company who we've had on previous webinars. So they are just one that we know of. I'm sure there are others. Uh, their interest is 2%. And I believe they, they give you all of the contract term up front. So if, if someone's going to, some, if you have repayment terms, that's six months and they're going to give you $2,000, you're getting that $2,000. You're just giving them 2%. And I believe there are small additional percentages for the duration um, of the repayment. So if it takes longer for that customer to repay you. But pretty affordable. Okay. Link in the chat box for that. Okay, there's a couple other things that you can do is reducing your inventory levels overall. If you have finished goods inventory sitting, sitting in your uh, warehouse, that is cash that is tied up. So by reducing that inventory, essentially by selling off inventory and reducing your production rates, you can generate more cash into the business rather than having inventory sitting in your business. Um, another thing that you can do as you're looking at your alternate products, services, et cetera, is when I look at alternate customers, another thing that I look at is who are my profitable customers and who are my less profitable customers. And one of the things that's important to look at here is um, looking at the size of orders that are produced by different customers. And I've, I've done this with a um, landscape supply, a, a nursery company. Um, and essentially what we did was went into their QuickBooks account. Actually, I think they use Peachtree accounting, but we went into their accounting system and had them produce a report of sales by customer or, sa or orders by customer. And then we're able to, to uh, look at the average order size and uh, put them in rank order and looked at the smallest orders and calculated what the gross margin was. Now the gross margin is the sale minus the sales price minus the cost of goods sold. So this is a nursery, they're bringing in plants, they're reselling them, that type of thing. So they have pretty high cost of goods sold, their profit margins, um, the gross margins tend to be about 25% on most of those products. So um, 
you look at the gross margin produced by a given sale and compare that to what the cost of processing that entire order is from the top, yeah, from making the sales order all the way through to delivering the product and collecting the money at the end, doing the invoicing and everything else. And you can come up with a rough idea of what your minimum order size is where the gross margin will cover those transaction costs. And every time I've done this with any kind of company, whether it's a distribution company, a manufacturing company, a nursery, we are able to find at least 30% of their customers on which they're really losing money when you start counting the amount of time and cost associated with transactions for the size orders that these people are placing. And by simply eliminating those, you eliminate those costs and you increase the amount of cash that's in your business. So that's another way you can look at your, do a deep dive into your customer base and identify those customers with which you're really not making any money and basically fire those customers. Okay, so looking at the outflows now, um, basically, we talked about this a little bit, going back to your vendors and negotiating payment terms. If you have, current, have currently have terms where you pay them within five days of delivery, see if you can defer that to 10 days or 15 or 30 um, so that you, have, you hold on to your cash longer before you have to go pay the vendor. You can talk to um, your creditors if you have loans out, go talk to the lenders. Right now, especially during uh, the pandemic, many of the lenders are willing to defer payments on loans for a month or two and just uh, either do interest only payments or to just accrue the interest and then uh, they'll, they'll pick up that up later. Because they understand that if they put too much pressure on businesses right now, um, they're not going to get any payment and they'll end up forcing businesses into uh, bankruptcy and they won't be able to service those loans. They won't have that business as a customer, et cetera. Same thing with rent and mortgage payment deferments. Um, many landlords are willing to defer rent or at least a portion of rent for a few months until things straighten out because they know it's, if they play hardball and you, um, you uh, don't pay your rent or unable to pay your rent that they're going to have to go through eviction and then go through firing, yeah, finding someone else to take over that space. And it's better bet if you're a good solid business in normal times, it's a better bet for them to stick with you and work with you. You obviously need to eliminate all unnecessary expenses. Anything you don't need to be doing right now, you shouldn't be doing. Um, you shouldn't be spending money on. Uh, if you can do some things for free that will benefit your company coming out the other end or during this time, by all means, do it. But you don't want to be out buying um, you know, trinkets that you're going to give out at the next trade show, that kind of thing right now. You want to eliminate all the unnecessary expenses. Um, if you have a large facility, you want to close down part of it and reduce the amount of utilities that you're uh, using to uh, keep that heated and that kind of thing. Um, Obviously, you want to delay any major projects, pull back on them, let them sit. And this is what's happening in a lot of areas right now in a lot of companies. And uh, the other thing is to reduce salaries and reduce staffing. Obviously, you don't want to do that if you don't need to. But, you know, there are some, certainly a lot of companies are furloughing or laying off employees. Uh, the management is taking reduced salary, in some cases, no salary. Um, as they go through this, and that obviously is in a move to increase your cash flow. Another thing you can do in this area is not necessarily reducing the number of people working for you, but reducing the hours. So using things like job sharing. Uh, this helps two ways. One, one it reduces your total salary or, or wages bill and increases the amount of cash in your business but it also um, allows you to do social distancing more easily and still get 
a reasonable amount of working hours in if you have if you do have a um, situation where you're still operating and you have a reasonable level of business. So doing job sharing, split shifts, things like that can address a couple different issues that we're facing at the moment. What's important, even if you're reducing staff, if you're furloughing them, is to make sure that you stay in contact with them, keep the relationship going, because hopefully you'll be able to, shortly, we'll be able to start bringing them back on and get them reemployed with you, because you're going to need them to help your business to get restarted and to, uh, to grow again. The other thing you can be doing that will improve cash outflows or decrease cash outflows is at this time to sit back and review your entire business, every business process you have, identify places to improve efficiencies, to reduce costs. And this again is a way to um, engage your staff. I've, I'm working with a salon owner right now who had to obviously close her salon all her stylists and other professionals um, are sitting at home. And so she started having uh, group meetings via um, one of the, t the technologies, I don't know if it's Zoom or uh, Hangouts, but having group meetings with several of them at a time at least and talking about how they can improve the, um, the salon's operations when they get back up from running. Asking the, the people, the staff, to help contribute some ideas. Um, it's a good time to do that, and it helps to build camaraderie, rapport, uh, teamwork within, within your employee base, even though they aren't working at the moment. So we're in a set, we're right now in a, in a uh, situation of uncertainty and we know where we're at at the moment, but we don't know where we're going, when we're going and how quickly we're going to get there. So everything is uncertain. So what do you do? Well, the first thing is make sure you communicate with every stakeholder, your vendors, your customers, your employees. Um, if you have investors or lenders, make sure you're talking to them on a regular basis, letting them know what you're doing and more importantly, what some of your plans are to restart or to expand, um, you know, can regrow your business. Um, look for opportunities to get additional access to additional liquidity or additional cap funds. Um, talk to your talk to your bank if you're in good financial shape normally in normal times. Go talk to your bank and see if you can arrange for a line of credit. It may just be a small line of credit right now, but at least it establishes it. And once you're back up and running and expanding your business, you can go back to your bank and, and um, ask for an increase in the line of credit that would track the increase in your revenues and in your profitability. Obviously, everybody's been talking about the government and the NGO, the non-government organizations and their funding programs, the grants, the loans, that kind of thing. Um, those are available, will continue to be available. Please keep an eye out for emails coming from the SBDC. We announce these on a weekly basis as they become available. Um, and uh, we're, we're certainly here to help you navigate these different programs as they come out. And there will be, I'm almost certain, there will be many more programs coming out at both at the state, the local and the federal level uh, to continue the recovery here, um, the survival and the recovery. Um, and then you can look at the owners, the ve investors, vendors, even customers are often in much better financial shape and willing to provide short-term loans um, through either delays in paying or advance payments from customers or, um, you know, and the owners, investors obviously are want to make sure that the company stays solvent and is able to recover from this. So they're often a source of loans. Uh, for the business. As I talked about earlier, you know, talk to your employees, get some ideas on what else you could be doing right now. Um, oftentimes the staff that's working in the business has ideas and sometimes they don't feel comfortable coming forth and, and offering them, so go ask. Uh, likewise, talk to your suppliers, see if they have alternatives to what you're currently using that might work just as well in your process or in your products or services and uh, are available to reduce cost. 
you should definitely create a 13 week, which is one quarter, one calendar quarter, uh, cash flow projection. Plan out when you're going to have to make payments, how much those payments will probably be, when you're going to get cash coming in, how much that cash will come in, and analyze it, look at it, figure out where you're going to have problems, and then start to plan for how you're going to, to plug those shortcomings if you're going to end up with shortcomings in cash. Again, you might be able to delay a payment for five days to one of your vendors uh, to negotiate that delay that payment and that takes care of a big problem for you, things like that. So um, look at that and continually update that. Every week you should just basically add another week on the end and correct for anything that's occurred in the meantime so that you can manage cash as you get through this process. And even when we reopen, you're gonna have to be managing cash um, as you go through the complete recovery stage. And again, as we talk about, start now, planning for recovery. How are you going to open? What's your facility is going to look like? How are you going to be able to handle customers? Get all that together, start writing things down. If it involves procedures that you're gonna to have to train your employees with, uh, you know, new procedures on how to deal with customers or how to deal with the processes that you have for delivery of services, get that all put together and kind of put together a manual almost for how you're going to reopen, how you're going to grow as we go through the next several months, many months possibly of social distancing and protective equipment and things like that. And finally, as you're doing all this and planning for recovery, keep in the back of your mind, start thinking of how are you going to position your company so that the next time something happens, you'll be better equipped to address and to face those challenges that occur. That's all I have. Um, now, are there any questions at this point? Yeah, you can go ahead and put your questions in the chat box. Also, if there are any strategies that you are thinking that you're going to try this month that we recommended, put that in the chat. We'd love to hear. Um, I'm going to go back and share my screen, Carl. That's all right. Okay. Um, so you can think about, think about your questions for a minute. We'll give everyone another minute because we are at five o'clock. In the chat box, I'm going to put a link for a brief survey. Since we are funded by the Small Business Administration, we have some requirements there. It's just four questions. We also really appreciate your feedback and um, we'll ask on one of the questions other topics that you might want to hear about. Um, so that's really helpful for us because we can find experts to uh, help come up with those trainings. Just to reiterate some of the resources that we have for you, remember we have a Google Doc that we update daily. That's a really good place to find out uh, updated information about the different SBA funding programs. I know there were some questions about that. Um, if you're not getting our newsletter, you can let me know. We try to send out updates to keep you informed, but not too many to overwhelm you. Um, let's see, we also will be working with the school, the Fox School of Business to have some, uh, some faculty assist hospitality businesses with compliance, and just even in terms of layout planning. So that's something to look forward to. Uh, we are also working on helping businesses add e-commerce platforms to their existing uh, website. So Carl mentioned thinking about how you can find different ways to, to, to bring in more of your cash flow. So if you haven't done any online sales, that could be something that you might want to think about. Um, there's a question if this will be emailed to us. Yes, we can definitely do that. There also will be a recording. Uh, we've been putting all of our COVID related virtual trainings on our YouTube channel. All of those are linked in that resource document. They're at the bottom uh, of that Google document. Let's see, um, we do have a question, we'll get to it in a moment, just wanted to reiterate our upcoming events that we have that you can sign up for on our website and how to contact us. Best way right now um, is to email 
sbdc at temple.edu or log in during our virtual Zoom hours between three and five. So there is a question um, about closing a brick and mortar and moving into production only as a cost saving measure. So Carl just thoughts about um, the riskiness of that or if that could be a viable cost saving measure. I'm sure there are a lot of businesses with that question. It's the, I, I think that if you're, you're considering that, um, I, I assume that you're considering closing permanently the brick and mortar store and moving into production. And then the question is, would you be continuing to sell to consumers or are you going to sell to retailers who would then sell to, to, uh, to the consumers? And so that would be that an answer to that as far as is it too big of a risk would be a deeper conversation. I think we'd have to talk about strategies and you know how yeah. how you're going to change your business model because essentially you're talking about a reasonably serious change uh, modification of the way you do business, the business model. So um, I would suggest that maybe you uh, arrange to talk to a consultant and to do a deeper dive into that question. I know that makes a lot of sense. I think if you are trying to do a major pivot, um, that would be the perfect, uh, the perfect topic to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation for. Whereas if you just have a quick question about um, an SBA program, you just have a quick question about your application, that would be, um, that would be a good place for our Zoom office hours because it's a big one. Okay, I just put our uh, survey in the chat, so we'd appreciate if you could complete that for us. Um, I will send out a follow-up email that will include our resources and the recording and the slide deck. Um, let's see, any other questions? Okay, I am not seeing, not seeing any. Uh, so we thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Carl, for this presentation. Let us know if there are some strategies that you're thinking about.